Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to today's webinar with Verinco, Manufacturing Intelligence, Test Data Analysis and Collaboration in the Electronics Industry. My name is Clive Coldwell, I'm Group Editor of Electronics Weekly and today's webinar will be available on demand after our session and it's accessible through the same link you're using now. However, we'd love to hear from you today, so do text during the presentation. If you have a question, please feel free to send it through the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of the page. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we'll be sure to follow afters. Finally, we'd like to encourage you to share today's webinar with your social networks. So without any further ado, may I express a warm welcome to our presenters today from Verinco, Tom and Vidar. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get going. Welcome to this webinar on manufacturing intelligence for the electronics industry. Today, we're going to take a closer look at the potential or the value that can be found in your test data from electronics production. How you can proactively use this type of data to improve the performance of your team and of your company. My name is Tom. And I'm joined today as well by my colleague Vidar, who, by the way, is going to run some great product demonstrations for you. Our company, Verinco, is a technology provider based in Norway, and I've been helping customers excel with electronics, manufacturing, test automation, and data analytics for more than 20 years now. We'll be sharing some of our own insights around the challenges that can come out of not having solid access to manufacturing data and why this can be damaging to your company. Now, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type this into the chat box in the, uh, in the webinar, and one of, the, one of us will respond to them continuously. We expect to spend around 55 minutes discussing and demonstrating this, or these values, using a combination of standard pre presentations, real customer examples, and product demonstrations to to link some very practical examples from manufacturing intelligence to certain buzzwords we hear more and more often, such as Industry 4.0 and Digital Transformation. But basically, we're going to look at um, how companies we work with today use this manufacturing data to, to reduce product failures, both during production and in the field how they improve their true production yields, significantly reduces the time spent looking for data for their engineers, so that their engineers can spend their time smarter, make a bigger impact. Okay, so at the core of why our customers succeed here, is their ability to make all of their test data available through making this data easily searchable, widely accessible, both inside their company, but also in their supply chain, so that the people most capable of addressing the detailed and rather high variety of problems and correlations in manufacturing can assist them fixing these, quick, these problems quickly, making sure that they can easily break down metrics like first-pass yield, into specific events and details that they can act on, such as the individual test results, measurements, and measurement trends. But also making sure that the data is quickly available so that it can be used to communicate what is happening right now, as opposed to the problems you had last week. And that despite what you may have come to believe from articles and presentations on, on topics such as Industry 4.0 and digital transformation, the electronics industry is nowhere near effective when it comes to dealing with manufacturing data. I want to say that you would be surprised to hear some of the, the stories and examples that we have on how companies deal with this data 
but I'm afraid that maybe many of you would not be surprised because you're <laughs> well aware of this already. And it's a, it's a little bit sad considering what year we are in where autonomous vehicles and 5G technologies are pushing technology boundaries. I mean, we still don't have autonomous flying cars, as I'm sure many of us have envisioned, including myself, when I was asked during elementary school to, to illustrate my prediction for the millennium. But we should, we should still be at a point in time where our access to information is better. Where the technical information on production performance is just as easily available as your neighbor's videos of his cat. So, you may have invested in manufacturing execution systems or similar. Unfortunately though, these kind of systems they will only give you a very small fraction of the data and the insights that you need for continuous improvements. And despite of, despite of what they actually promised you. The one problem at the typical company in this sector, that, like your company, probably spends significant resources simply looking for test data. The, the average engineer across industries spend 30% of their time looking for information. That's not, not 10, not 20, 30%. And that equals an incredible 1.5 day per working week. Now one issue is that this directly affects the performance, or, or let's rather say productivity, of your engineers, your product deliveries. They spend 30% extra time on average. Just, just imagine going to a, uh, to a local restaurant. You order a nice meal, eager to get the, the food served. However, in this particular restaurant, you have to wait, on average, 30% longer for the food to arrive. Because the chef is looking for the right recipes in his books, and reading them for each and every meal. Now you eat up, ask for the check, but, uh, but you have to wait 30% longer to get the check while the waiter goes back and confers the kitchen on what you ate. When you're leaving, you must wait another 30% longer for the taxi because the driver has to stop at every intersection to, to check his position on a printed map. Ridiculous, right? Surely there must be technology that can help speed this up. Now, how long do you think that restaurant or the cab driver would be able to stay in business running like this today? But in the industry, wow, we, we accept these 30%. Okay. Minor Minor derail, sorry. M more importantly, however, than, than lost productivity, is that the, these 1.5 days, more or less wasted each week, reduces your ability to innovate. I mean, what your future depends on. Second problem in this industry is that the, for the most part, companies designing electronics, they lack essential data from subcontractors. That, that's making any decent picture of complete product quality near impossible to achieve, no matter how much time you spend looking for data. I'm sure many of you are well aware of this because maybe you filter the Test data that goes to your customers, yourself, to, to make it look good. A third problem is that in, 
in general, companies are very reactive in their responses to problems. They they act on incidents that has already happened, such as a large or a product recall. It doesn't have to be large necessarily. And often it's because of problem number four here that these companies are mostly looking at the rather limited data that is available to them at a very low level. For example, monitoring the the trends, or careful, carefully monitoring the trends of a handful assumed to be important test measurements. But leaving all other measurements, all of other test processes completely in their blind spot. So there's no higher level view available for them. Nothing that tells them what the bigger issues are and what is hurting their current profitability the most. Microsoft Excel is um, often used to analyze test data within many of these, these companies and represents another red flag here. Problem number five. Now don't get me don't get me wrong. I love Excel. I, I use it frequently myself also for, for various tasks. Probably even too much even. Very often simply because it is available on my laptop. I don't have to ask anybody, I don't have to buy it. It's just there. But for this task, however, it it will fall short when you look at the alternatives that you have available. And this shortcoming will continue to worsen rapidly moving forward. The good news, though, is that, as, as mentioned already, all of this is more or less the, the industry average, including for some of your competitors. So it hasn't necessarily been a big problem, at least up until now. The thing is that it's it's not sustainable moving forward because it leads to to inflated R&D costs, inflated production costs. A, the report from McKinsey here states that companies who perform well when it comes to using production data for continuous improvements and supply chain management, we'll see a reduction in product cost by up to 40% and an increase in productivity of up to 160%. The thing to keep in mind though is what this also implies, that the, um, the companies on the other side of the, the spectrum, I mean the ones with no reduction in product costs or productivity gains will long, long, no longer be able to operate with profits. And with the COVID pandemic upon it, it is actually expected that the penalties for low performance in manufacturing will happen sooner than previously estimated. So it's not necessarily something that I can wait until next year to, to get better, better control of this, better insight into your data. I mean, how can you, for example, effectively support your your production, your factory, when you are working remotely, unless your company have a strong digital backbone? I mean, without you having easy access to data. But obviously, to get to this um, this lighthouse level, it's not easy. However, not all these digitalization projects needs to be complex. Sunto, as an example here, we're able to fully convert their entire existing test infrastructure from offline test machines to cloud-connected industrial IoT devices in only a matter of weeks instantly helping their engineers to better understand what was happening during production. Instantly teaching them about problems that they only had the slightest suspicion ex uh, existed. Hopefully, hopefully, by the end of this webinar, you will have confidence 
that is actually fully possible to go even faster than soon to on this. Both integrate your stations and be up and running with analyzing your data in only a matter of days. So we'll see some very specific examples of this uh, quite soon, of, of what type of insights you can get very quickly. But before we go into the um, technicalities, I'd just like to, to share a short story that highlights some more generic benefits of, of data and information flow. It's about, um, about four or uh, maybe even five years ago, a, a team leader for a group of test operators, like one of our customers, where we will anonymize him as uh, Jacob here, experienced uh, several relatively mild symptoms that in in retrospect could be indicative of a heart failure. Now this was following a period where Jacob had been down with the with the flu. So now even though Jacob acknowledged the symptoms as concerning, he kind of just brushed them off as trivial, went on with his life. Took his uh, son and daughter on a two week vacation to the to the Mediterranean shortly after. Now, Jacob, he had a um, generally high tendency to make such quick gut decisions. Combine also with the opinion that you need to be sick for real, beyond just the flu, to you go see a doctor. I'm sure we all know people like this. Some of us are just like Jacob, who are hesitant to go to the, to the doctor. The reasoning can easily be influenced by the simple inconvenience of it. And maybe we rationalize by saying that we are experiencing temporary reactions to, to other factors, such as the, as the flu, in Jacob's case. So we delay it. But the point here is Jacob's decision to not make that visit. It's very much a subjective decision. And in most cases, nobody besides ourselves have enough data to really question these decisions, enough information. So the consequence then is that in, in many cases, the visit to the doctor becomes very late, just as companies often respond very late, very reactively to problems. And just as in, I mean, in manufacturing, many decisions are based on the subjective opinions, I mean, hunches maybe, of the individuals with the loudest voice. If Jacob had recognized his own symptoms earlier, it might have been better alternatives available, maybe a modest adjustment of his lifestyle. Analogies to simple process adjustments in the in the industrial world. But he, you know, he didn't know, and all of a sudden he found himself at a uh, critical point where the collateral damage to his heart issue unfortunately also became severe and caused damage to his kidneys, forcing him forcing him on a long dependency on dialysis and a later uh, kidney, kidney transplant as well. Now, fortunately, besides the, uh, I mean, the consequences that, that naturally normally follow such surgeries, Jacob is relatively well up to date. But, but in these days, the emergence of IoT technology within healthcare makes this decision to seek input or professional help more proactive. I mean, helping you to deal with the health issues up front. Where Jacob's subjective interpretation of his symptoms would not make it easier for him to ignore the problem. Because IoT kind of moves information across these traditional boundaries and walls to where it should be. You can take the, take the Apple Watch as an example. 
all of a sudden Jacob could have an ECG device connected to his body at any time, monitoring his heart pattern and, and compare this to his baseline value. But not only that, I mean, his watch is connected to a larger global analytical service. So Jacob would not just be monitoring his heart against himself. It would be monitoring together with everyone else. And all of them contributing to improving the algorithms that it runs locally on everyone's watch. And all of them benefiting from it. Like this example here. Where a man from the UK in his 30s was warned of an upcoming heart attack by his watch. The symptoms he explained when he arrived at the ER did not trigger any alarms for the doctor. There was a like a no failure found repair type in the, in the factory context. But the data from the ECG that they simply looked at by precaution forced him to reconsider. And it actually turned out he had two leaking heart valves and was nearing a fatal heart failure. And in, in theory as well, it doesn't matter where in the world you are. I mean, as long as your watch has internet access, you can upload your health data to the cloud for instant evaluation. It doesn't just save the measurements locally or on a server in a massive spreadsheet file that you can look at after you get sick because the value of today's data will fall fast as time progress. Same is true in manufacturing. The value of your production data will fall quickly as time goes by. But still, for the most part, we feel fine with storing massive amounts of this data in local CSV files or SQL databases just in case we need to analyze it in the future. Okay, so let's, for the sake of the argument, ignore how, uh, how exciting, how attractive all of us as individuals find this scenario with connected monitoring. Let's rather consider the benefits for local and national healthcare providers, the organizations who must manage all the health issues of the population. And it's relatively easy to argue that this type of monitoring has the potential to revolutionize healthcare, not only saving individual lives, as you saw an example of, but also offering huge annual cash savings, treatments and post-treatment. And equally relevant here, freeing up considerable time for the doctors, the engineers of healthcare, time they can spend on more complex problems, more impactful solutions. Just imagine the potential productivity gain in any hospital if all your symptoms and medical history were easily accessible through a, um, a common web interface. Or, even better, imagine a wearable device that, you, that could detect hundreds of health symptoms in you. Remotely send this to a healthcare consultant who would call you if things were off. That future scenario would be priceless for Jacob a few years ago. So although the technology aspect here might sound relatively simple, this type of process disrupting technology in healthcare might may be difficult to see the full future potential of. It's still uh, science fiction to some degree. But the concept is actually not too far away from today's potential with industrial IoT devices in electronics manufacturing. It's these types of organizational benefits that are relevant to manufacturing. The organ failures we are looking to prevent here are the many waste activities that you all have. 
it's the unnecessary warranty claims, product recalls that inevitably happen. I mean, even the kind of potentially severe field failures that your customer will experience. So although the impact in manufacturing tends to be less draconian compared to actual organ failures, the, the total sum of all of these issues, I mean, even the minor ones, can cause dramatic outcomes for a company. And as we, as we discussed the value of today's manufacturing symptoms, it goes significantly down as the days, weeks, or even months progress, unless you use it. The other similarities here as well are many. Most, if not all, your products go through automated production testing to see that the build process was okay. All of these tests generate data, data that shows the symptoms of your product and production operations. And ideally, test sequences that evaluate each unit will detect these symptoms perfectly, just like we ideally would know our bodies inside and out and know exactly what symptoms we should be concerned about. But we don't, and our test systems are never perfect as well. Very often simply due to the dynamics involved with making products. All these individual contributions. And even if you manage to get perfect test coverage, that will only apply until the next time there is a minor change in these process inputs, like the replacement of a component or a new or for a new product revision or an upgrade of a test instrument. And now just like the I mean the health wearables, these test systems also have algorithms that need continuous improvement and adjustments to operate effectively. New product revisions will typically change the characteristics of your units under test and therefore requires modifications of the test sequences. So the first demonstration that we're going to see now shows a very common scenario highlighting a, a low severity but still costly problem that will happen when you are not able to effectively manage your test limits. So to understand the data and get an overview we start at the top. Here is a world map showing your manufacturing locations. They are marked with different colors showing their first pulse yield. Let us uh, have a look at the red bubble. We make a query for the products at this location and we look at their different yield numbers. Let us pick a low one. We click the menu button and choose the next level down called test step yield and analysis. Here we, all, uh, here we have all the units corresponding to the filter value we chose in the previous step. Uh, we hit apply and then what will uh, show us the top 10 failures. Uh, the number one failure is called power load. It has failed 39 times and counts for 24% of all the failures for this uh, test sequence. So this is the best way to start. We click it and we open the details view. This now shows all the results for this step along with its high and low limits. As we can see there's a shift in the data. Um, so we move our cursor we see it's happening around the 23rd of November. So this will cause this step to fail more often and it could be due to a lot of different things like a bad batch of components a specific test station failing, calibration issues. However, Watts will notify you if there is a drop in yield and you can quickly address the issue before it gets you into more trouble. Okay, back to you, Domana. Okay, thank you. So, there are several challenges to how most companies treat 
test and repair today. One one issue is that the decision to send a product to the um, to the repair technician or the the doctor is often a subjective decision, a decision that is made by the the factory and test operators Jacob and his peers. And just as we discussed that seeing the actual doctor can be inconvenient, so can it in the factory context here. So there will be many rational reasons why an operator may wish to avoid sending a unit to repair, but rather choose to retest it. Or even for a repair technician to incorrectly interpret information on a given test failure. And in a modern supply chain, you end up with very many such operators being been, being involved with building your products. Many operators with invisible individual contributions to how well you are performing and what happens to your products during production. Now, you might disagree that they have this autonomy because you you have a test policy that covers this, how they're going to act and behave uh, with your product. But still, I'm afraid that most of you will be wrong. We've seen countless cases, even from tightly regulated industries such as medical and defense, showing that this is a real problem. You can take the, take the very common scenario of, as re, of retesting failing products as an example. So I'm sure we can easily agree that the, the main reason companies specify the maximum number of tests allowed before a repair must take place is to safeguard the integrity of the test and to protect the quality of the products. And that is important. It should have a very high priority. The worst example I've seen uh, is, a, um, is a product in an in-circuit test that was tested 52 times on a single day before eventually passing and then being shipped from the subcontractor to our customer. So obviously not ideal, probably something that justifies scrapping the unit. But our customer, that was the product owner, he had no way of knowing this before seeing the historical data in what's as part of a product evaluation that took place six months after the incident. Now, they only received test reports from their subcontractor saying that the final test was good. Another very unfortunate example was an FDA regulated medical device where the test operator himself changed the test limits after eight failed attempts with the, the sole purpose of making that one unit pass before changing the limits back again to its original value. You could, you could literally feel the agony of the quality assurance manager, manager when we showed him the data and what was really happening in their factory. And when we can't even keep track of, of these things, the important things, how many are able to consider the, the smaller problem with the time inefficiencies that comes from this retesting? Factory time that contributes to inflating your cost of production. So a very um, a simplified example that we have here. For a medium cost industrial product shows that if you have a first pass yield of 85%, it can result in retesting time that alone inflates the actual internal unit cost by almost 8%. If you improve the first pass yield to 90%, it should be a very moderate objective here, you can reduce the unit cost by 4%. And if you are going to get to the 
a 40% reduction in product costs. So we earlier mentioned you need to be able to avoid these unnecessary expenses as well. So we'll use that as an introduction to our next demonstration on how you can better track the damages caused by retesting. So checking your retesting is quite easy to do in Watts. We'll choose the report over here called periodic yield. So in this uh, example, I'm going to use my old C power supply. Choose the grouping and I'm going to choose yearly grouping because I have a quite big time span of my production. I click apply and Watts will load um, the yearly um, manufacturing uh, numbers. So in 2016, 17 and 18. I'm going to use 2018, where I had 5,185 units uh, tested, 4,377 passed, which gives me a yield of 84.4%. So the question is, what happened to those 800 units that didn't pass in the first run? If I expand over here, I'll get the list of the, all the products that I built, their total count, their pass count, and their individual yield. And at the bottom here of this report, there's a bar graph showing me um, what happened to these other units. So for instance, I had 510 units passing in the second run, 94 passing in the third, 53 passing in the fourth, and so on. I even had one serial number passing in the 19th run. Now, if I calculate this up based on the time I spend on each test run, I'll get to about 91 hours spent on just retesting the products. And as Tomana pointed out, this represents a cost, something that you can definitely spend elsewhere. Now, I would like to um, do some more investigation. For instance, on this serial number that was tested 19 times. So let's click here. Okay, so what we did now is that we loaded a report called serial number history. There's just one serial number and the part number combination here. And here's a list of all the tests that I've performed on this unit. So there's a lot of failure starting here on 23rd of September. So it was tested multiple times and failed then on 24th and the 25th. And then it passed in the end. But there's no information on what actually happened to this unit. It was just retested 19 times. So it seems to me like it's a, it's a bad product, or it could be failing in the field. Now, we want to investigate further. So the next step in Watts would be to go to the test step yield and analysis report, where we were before. We click this, we load um, the serial number, part number under investigation. And in addition, I'm not going to use the first run, but I'm going to run uh, analysis on all the runs for this unit. So I hit apply. And now what's will load all the test runs. So there are 18 test runs. And I see there's a difference here. It was run on a software uh, version 1.12.0. And there was one test run on a software version 1.11. Zero. So that's a difference, and it could be the reason why it was uh, passing in the end on, uh, on one of these. So let's have um, a, a deeper look. Let's choose all of them, hit apply again. We'll see the top 10 failures. There's just one failure. It's this test called charge rate C41. I failed 18 times. So let's click this and see uh, the detailed measurements for this test step.
So here are all the measurements. And I can see my limits, high limit are 3.8. So all the measurements are above the high limit. But then at the end here, the limit is different. And I can see that these are tested on two different test stations, FT01 and FT02. They're running different software in this case. So that's the reason why it was uh, passing in the end, although it should have been failing on the FT02 as well. Now, this is also something that we could handle by uh, running our software distribution tool to make sure that all the test stations are running the same type of software. We'll get back to that in, uh, in a minute. So part, part of the reason why this retesting occurs is because the test operators are free to consider the test failure from their own perspective. And that's for the most part a good thing, as long as it follows your test policy, because it gives them autonomy, it gives them flexibility, and as skilled employees, they need this. However, our brain, is optimized to quickly create plausible realities based on pieces of incomplete information uses, using the experiences that we have that we have made. Some research actually suggests that we make on average a mind-blowing 35,000 decisions each day. So if, if Jacob has never seen a bat before it might be easy for his autopilot to kick in and suggest that these rat-looking birds are in the middle of a Bruce Lee-style street fight. And we make incorrect judgments all the time. But knowledge helps us to see things differently. And the data from tests help us to build relevant knowledge around your production. So, if the first demonstration that we saw represents the norm, where changes of a design were done without updating the test limits. It's no wonder that Jacob feels justified to rerun a failing test multiple times, because the ones he sends to repair are constantly returned. There's no failure found. And I've Frustrating that must be. To him, it might seem obvious that the test system is not good, doing a good enough job to evaluate if there is something wrong with the unit or not. And to him, it may be seem obvious that he can do a better job on determining if this is a real failure or not. And just as Jacob was very capable of convincing himself that his medical symptoms did not require attention, the test operator can often convince himself that small, minor actions such as uh, interventions to the test systems are justified, and perhaps changing the test limits as we discussed. Since he once saw what specific file that the test development engineers used to do that, Or maybe applying some physical pressure to the test fixture to help a unit pass, because his logic tells him that there is poor connectivity in the test interface. But, but how can he then be sure that the actual problem is not a poor connection on the unit itself? And that all he actually achieved was throwing some low-grade duct tape on the product to make it pass the test. Obviously he can't. But still, these scenarios happen. They happen in every single industry that manufacture electronics. And it's only a fraction of the companies who are really aware of it. So if you would like to change this behavior, 
one good approach is to um, actively manage the performance of the test system make sure that the, the tolerance and test limits are accurate that all connections and interfaces are good actively maintained and make sure that the repair reports with no failure found are followed up on simply because the test operator has then indicated that the reason for this test failure lies with how the test was executed. So maybe, maybe this sounds obvious to you, I don't know. But in reality, it is very difficult for most companies. You probably have easy access to the uh, repair report that said no failure found perhaps from your MES solution but most likely you don't have easy access to the corresponding test records and test measurements so you're not able to to use these events to learn to use data and KPIs to monitor the symptoms coming out of your factory and respond to these or put simply you would be unable to have continuous improvements and moving forward, if you want to avoid the side of the competitive spectrum opposite to the lighthouse manufacturers, data-informed continuous improvements will be a critical competence. But think about it. I mean, if you don't have this, when one of your products inevitably fails in the hands of a customer, how can the aftermarket team tell what actual symptoms this unit presented during production and feed that back? How can they tell if this is a problem still affecting other products? If they can help stop these units while they are in the factory, the cost will go down by at least a factor of 10. And we know this from the 10x cost rule of manufacturing or if an undetected component issue on a PCB causes a downstream module or system level test to fail how can the quality assurance team know if this is a bigger issue that will affect multiple other system assemblies as well or if an oscilloscope that has not been properly warmed up before testing starts on a Monday morning causes high false failure rates and results in a suspension of the product or the production line. How will the industrialization team quickly see this trend from the data so that the production can resume at minimal downtime? And now all of these are examples of, of, um, problems, challenges that we experience and see customers are challenged by all the time in manufacturing. But unfortunately, it's only the, or often only, the severe incidents that will force you to investigate. It's the, it's the shock of the heart attack that will force a change, but often to a huge cost. So in the medical example that we saw, you end up with bearing the cost of people medical leave or, or hospital admissions. But in the industrial world, you may, might, end, might end up with sporadic shutdowns of production lines, critical field failures, product recalls, or just a steady bleeding of cash due to, to invisible inefficiencies. And the problems under the surface that are affecting almost all companies in this sector. One of our customers, Delta Electronics, they, they reported that the average problem resolution time went down by more than 95%, almost immediately after adopting what's making collaboration with their subcontractors far more efficient than before. And 
freeing up considerable time for their test R&D engineers that they could channel into more meaningful and rewarding projects. If you recall that futuristic example with uh, remote monitoring of health data that was automatically sent to the to the doctor who could call you. This is the reality of the engineering team at Delta. It's not science fiction for them. They're in complete control with access to all the data that they need to quickly evaluate what is happening. Another very common scenario with New Watch customers is that they are able to look at their historical data through a different lens and understand why they had specific problems in the past. Why certain products had high warranty rates, for example. So the, the next demonstration that we'll have a look at now illustrates this scenario quite well, where a quality problem was not detected where it actually originated. To illustrate this, I'm going to use the Process Capability Analysis Report. So I'm using the OLC Power Supply products again. So here is a list of all the uh, products in that group. So we're going to have a look at the uh, Power Board. We hit Apply. And now what's is calculating the CPK for all the numerical test steps for this test sequence. So I have a list here. And then in the first column, I see the CPK. And in short, a red number shows a bad CPK, meaning that the limits may be too narrow for the data that uh, this test is giving us. A green number is a CPK uh, between 1.32 and 4, shows, shows that limit may be OK. And a blue number would indicate that uh, the limits are too wide. Now here's an interesting uh, test called the Measure Isolated 12 Volt. So with all the data, the CPK is 1.13. However, if I take out the ones that failed, it shows that the um, CPK is now 8.18. This would indicate that the limits are too wide and there may be outliers uh, in this data set that is not uh, failing this test. So let's have a closer look. So I'm loading the um, step details report. I've taken out the ones that uh, is failing the test. So as we can see, the limits, they are quite wide compared to the data return from this test step. And you can clearly see there are units that are way outside of the normal distribution and probably should have failed this test step. So let's have a look at one of these. I move my cursor to the, to the one at the end here. Serial number 1057-8181. We click this, uh, it loads the complete test report, uh, it expands on that test step that we're currently on, it has passed as we saw. But for, for seeing the uh, complete history for this unit, I click this uh, serial number here at the top of the report. Uh, then uh, what's will load the serial number history report and I can see the complete history for this unit. So it was tested here uh, in the PCBA test, passing, and then it's, it became part of a different module, so it's now a subunit uh, passing the final function test. And then two years later, it came back uh, and failed in an RMA test. The 10x cost rule implies that finding an issue uh, it, in the next process is 10 times more expensive than finding it in the previous um, process. So here we have a unit passing the PCBA test and the final function test and then eventually failing in the field. Maybe it's your customer 
that's discovering this. And you could have uh, avoided this if you had uh, had your um, correct limits set up in the first place. We can also go one step further into the data, clicking this uh, menu over here and have a look at the unit history to try to figure out what happened after it came back. So eventually it went to repair and it was scrapped. And this could make you liable for replacing this unit um, at the customer site, uh, even increasing your cost more. All of the examples that we see here are a subset of what we call manufacturing intelligence. So it's the combination of this together with industrial IoT that will allow for the, the improvements that we are discussing in your company. And they do so by integrating your existing test stations or existing test data to a in-house or typically cloud deployed service where all these symptoms from tests are continuously recorded and monitored. And you can integrate to this by standard plug and play support if you have sequence server frameworks, works such as TestStand from National Instruments. You can build converters for your existing test reporting formats without having to make any adjustments to your test software. For proof of concept, this is the most common scenario where we very often make these converters for you. Or you can integrate directly into your custom sequencers by using our API. And the, um, the symptoms that what's then will communicate and visualize, visualize for you are often related to what we've seen demonstrated uh, already today. So what, what changes in the true production yield has happened recently or how well your test operators, test assets are performing. What well, test limits are not accurately evaluating the symptoms displayed on the test. Or what individual test steps are frequently failing. The, um, the final demonstration for today is an example of a perhaps more traditional failure scenario where the, the test limits are good but the quality of the product is questionable. And where we can enrich test data with information from repair to better understand the root cause of the problem. For this demonstration, we're gonna start off in the yield report. And we're gonna look at um, our old C130P product, uh, we have about 4,000 units and a uh, bad yield at 86%. So let's go to the next level. We click this menu and we open up the test up yield and analysis report. So here are all the software versions and revisions listed. We're just going to choose all of them and uh, do our uh, uh, top 10 failure analysis. So here's the list of top 10 failures. My uh, top failure is this called charge rate C31. It failed uh, 135 times and accounts for about 25% of all the failures for this test sequence. Now let's investigate further. Let's click this uh, bar. So, as you can see here in the step details view, in the uh, overall status view here at the top, the units were primarily passing, there were some failures at the beginning of the period, and then it started failing more and more. And you can see that on the data below, you have your high limits, your low limits, and uh, the data is pretty much stable inside of the uh, limits, but then around the Jul July the 9th, it starts failing more and more. 
Okay, so let's have a, a little deeper look into this data. And I can do that by grouping. And in this case, I'm going to group by revision. So as you can see here, we have two revisions. We have 9 and 10. If we look at 9, the data looks pretty stable. And if we look at 10, you can see this is the version that have all the uh, failures. In this case, we have coupled the data with the repair information. So let's switch to um, the re repair analysis. So here's a report that I run on the product, we'll see 130p and revision 10. You can see the uh, fail step report. It's the charge rate C31 that's failing the most has been repaired the most, and it counts as 17 times in this case. And if I wanted to have a closer look at what the repairs actually were, I can open this. And here you can see that there is a component that is now outside of uh, specification. So um, uh, revision change and uh, a new component has causing this um, uh, to be repaired more often. As you could see from that example, the value of your test data increases when it's combined with other data sets, such as repair information. And when this type of detailed information is easily available, informed decision, decisions becomes the norm. So you're no longer guessing on what is happening, you actually know. And just as wearable IoT health technology might help to lower the cost of healthcare, manufacturing intelligence will help you reduce the resources needed for production. It will let you learn from previous events, and in doing so, what will help you reduce the warranty costs We'll make sure your engineers can spend less time looking for relevant information. Time they can spend on more innovative tasks, more fun tasks. So there are two frameworks in which we help the Watts customers use this manufacturing intelligence to get to this level of control. Both of them starts with the data that is available from your existing products and processes. So on one hand, what will help your teams to quickly visualize and understand this data to support in implementing the necessary improvements. It could be simple things such as tweaking the test equipment uh, to, to more challenging, more bureaucratic issues such as reconsidering a product design or, or providing negative feedback on the quality of work from a subcontractor. You typically need data for this data that you can all agree, conclude on. The other framework is the automated one. And this is where Watts will monitor your data and act according to configurable logic. Could be alarms on drop in production yields, could be operator errors where a product does not follow the correct production route. It can also be things such as rule-based software distribution to make sure that the, the latest firmware and test software is available to any station immediately after being released. Not only internally, but also in your supply chain, as I mentioned. To avoid problems such as the one we saw in a previous demo with retesting, where the, the test limits of the, the versions of the software were different for two stations. Could be automated monitoring of the calibration, maintenance status of your test assets. What can even provide you with real time work in progress information throughout the build process to help your operations team with scheduling, inventory planning, those kind of things. 
And although a fully automated manufacturing intelligence architecture tightly integrated with your other business systems may represent an ideal future state, it actually all starts today here with having good visibility into your data in key performance metrics. Making sure that your employees, your partners, has easy access to this. Using this data to help the factory operators perform even better on the job. And the, the return of this investment is often immediate, as articulated by one of our customers here. And so a massive reduction in test failures with only a few weeks. So our call to action for you after this webinar is to start this path already today by registering your What's trial account. So even though this account contains generic demonstration data, the best evaluation experience will be with your own data. So if you sign up using the URL shown here, we will create a data converter for you for free and extend your trial period from 30 to 60 days. I mean, you can literally start using what's within just a few days. And your upfront commitment, besides sitting through this webinar, can be as little as an hour or two. So that brings us to the end of the webinar. I mean, a big thank you to all of you that were kind enough to reserve time to join us. If you would like to share this webinar with a colleague, will be made available for you on demand afterwards. If you have any additional questions that was not answered in the chat during the presentations, the easiest way to get in touch is by going to whats.com, clicking the contact button in the upper right corner, I think it is. So again, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Well, thank you very much uh, to Tom and Vida. Thanks, Tom. As Tom's already said, um, if you haven't managed to get through with your questions, rest assured we'll get back to you. I think Vrinko has been working relentlessly in recent years to make manufacturing intelligence more accessible for the electronics industry, and easier to adopt and easier to scale and more affordable. That's great, really. So it's interesting to see Tom and Vida's presentation today as a sort of update to what they're up to and what they're doing. Um, it really remains to thank you for being with us today. Um, goodbye and thank you for watching.